Section four of How to Sing. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ruth Golding. How to Sing by Lily Lehman. Translated by Richard Aldrich. Section four. The Singer's Physiological Studies. Science has explained all the processes of the vocal organs in their chief functions, and many methods of singing have been based upon physiology, physics, and phonetics. To a certain extent, scientific explanations are absolutely necessary to the singer, as long as they are confined to the sensations in singing, foster understanding of the phenomenon, and summon an intelligible picture for the hitherto unexplained voice sensations or for the ordinarily misunderstood expressions of full, bright, dark, nasal, singing forward, etc. They are quite meaningless without the practical teachings of the sensations of such singers as have directed their attention to them with a knowledge of the end in view, and are competent to correlate them with the facts of science. The singer is usually worried by the word physiology but only because he does not clearly understand the limits of its teachings. The singer need, will, and must know a little of it. We learn so much that is useless in this life, why not learn that which is of the utmost service to us? What, in brief, does it mean? Perfect consciousness of the action of the vocal organs and of the voluntary placing and mixing of all vowels the fact that the soft palate can be drawn up against the hard palate, that the tongue is able to take many different positions, and that the larynx, by the assistance of the vocal sound O, takes a low position, and by that of the vowels A and E a high and closer one, that all muscles contract in activity and in normal inactivity are relaxed that we must strengthen them by continued vocal gymnastics so that they may be able to sustain long-continued exertion, and must keep them elastic and use them so. It includes also the well-controlled activity of diaphragm, chest, neck, and face muscles. This is all that physiology means for the vocal organs. Since these things all operate together, one without the others can accomplish nothing. If the least is lacking, singing is quite impossible or is entirely bad. Physiology is concerned also with muscles, nerves, sinews, ligaments and cartilage, all of which are used in singing, but all of which we cannot feel. We cannot even feel the vocal cords. Certainly much depends for the singer upon their proper condition and whether as voice producers or breath regulators, we all have good reason always to spare them as much as possible, and never to overburden them. Though we cannot feel the vocal cords, we can nevertheless hear, by observing whether the tone is even, in the emission of the breath under control, whether they are performing their functions properly. Overburdening them through the pressure of uncontrolled breath results in weakening them. The irritation of severe coughing, thoughtless talking or shouting immediately after singing, may also set up serious congestion of the vocal cords, which can be remedied only through slow gymnastics of the tongue and laryngeal muscles, by the pronunciation of vowels in conjunction with consonants. Inactivity of the vocal organs will not cure it, or perhaps not till after the lapse of years. See exercise ye, ye, you, ya, you. A good singer can never lose his voice. Mental agitation or severe colds can, for a time, deprive the singer of the use of his vocal organs, or seriously impair them. Only those who have been singing without consciously correct use of their organs can become disheartened over it. Those who know better will, with more or less difficulty, cure themselves, and by the use of vocal gymnastics bring their vocal organs into condition again. For this reason, if for no other, 
singers should seek to acquire accurate knowledge of their own organs, as well as of their functions, that they may not let themselves be burnt, cut, and cauterized by unscrupulous physicians. Leave the larynx and all connected with it alone. Strengthen the organs by daily vocal gymnastics and a healthy, sober mode of life. Beware of catching cold after singing. Do not sit and talk in restaurants. Students of singing should use the early morning hours and fill their days with the various branches of their study. Sing every day only so much that on the next day you can practice again feeling fresh and ready for work, as regular study requires. Better one hour every day than ten today and none tomorrow. The public singer should also do his practising early in the day, that he may have himself well in hand by evening. How often one feels indisposed in the morning. Any physical reason is sufficient to make singing difficult or even impossible. It need not be connected necessarily with the vocal organs. In fact, I believe it very rarely is. For this reason, in two hours everything may have changed. I remember a charming incident in New York. Albert Niemann, our heroic tenor, who was to sing Lohengrin in the evening, complained to me in the morning of severe hoarseness. To give up a role in America costs the singer, as well as the director, much money. My advice was to wait. Niemann, what do you do, then, when you are hoarse? I, oh, I practice and see whether it still troubles me. Niemann, indeed, and what do you practice? I, long, slow scales. Niemann, even if you are hoarse? I. Yes, if I want to sing or have to, I try it. Niemann. Well, what are they? Show me. The great scale. The infallible cure. I showed them to him. He sang them with words of abuse in the meantime, but gradually his hoarseness grew better. He did not send word of his inability to appear in the evening, but sang and better than ever with enormous success. I myself had to sing Norma in Vienna some years ago, and got up in the morning quite hoarse. By nine o'clock I tried my infallible remedy, but could not sing above A-flat, though in the evening I should have to reach high D-flat and E-flat. I was on the point of giving up, because the case seemed to me so desperate. Nevertheless, I practised till eleven o'clock, half an hour at a time, and noticed that I was gradually getting better. In the evening I had my D-flat and E-flat at my command, and was in brilliant form. People said they had seldom heard me sing so well. I could give numberless instances, all going to show that you never can tell early in the day how you are going to feel in the evening. I much prefer, for instance, not to feel so very well early in the day, because it may easily happen that the opposite may be the case later on, which is much less agreeable. If you wish to sing only when you are in good form, you must excuse yourself ninety-nine times out of a hundred. You must learn to know your own vocal organs thoroughly, and be able to sing, must do everything that is calculated to keep you in good condition. This includes chiefly rest for the nerves, care of the body, and gymnastics of the voice, that you may be able to defy all possible chances. Before all, never neglect to practice every morning regularly proper singing exercises through the whole compass of the voice. Do it with painful seriousness, and never think that vocal gymnastics weary the singer. On the contrary, they bring refreshment and power of endurance to him who will become master of his vocal organs. This is the duty of every singer who wants to exercise his art publicly. End of section 4